Hello, everyone. This is a talk I gave about recent advances in neonatal resuscitation at the Baylor Avoiding Lung Injury Conference on October 18th, 2019. But this talk also had a subtitle, Sailing Through the Mist. And that's helpful because it gives me my main objectives for the talk. SAIL refers to sustained lung inflation, and specifically the SAIL trial. In the second part, I'll be talking about MIST, or Minimally Invasive Surfactant Treatment, although I'll be using the term LISA for Less Invasive Surfactant Administration. But first, some disclosures. I have no financial conflicts of interest. I am a passionate and opinionated person when it comes to delivery room care, but I'm going to do my best today to describe recent evidence as best I understand it. But these are my opinions, and they do not reflect any other organization, and they certainly do not constitute clinical advice. In the year 2019, if you were to hold a photo contest between mechanical ventilation and non-invasive ventilation, non-invasive ventilation wins. And so this talk today really is about ways that we can make non-invasive ventilation more successful. The first way would be to avoid intubation in the first place, and this is where sustained lung inflation comes in. This video demonstrates a sustained lung inflation. In previous trials, a pressure of 20 to 30 centimeters of water was held for anywhere between 5 and 20 seconds on the initial breath on a baby that needed PPV. This demonstration was for 15 seconds, just like in the SAIL trial. Previous meta-analyses had shown that perhaps sustained lung inflation could decrease the need for mechanical ventilation in the first 72 hours of life. But in other outcomes such as BPD or mortality, there was no difference. So this was an area in need of a well-powered randomized controlled trial. The SAIL trial enrolled babies at 23 to 26 weeks gestational age that required PPV in the delivery room. If they were randomized to the sustained lung inflation arm, they received 15 seconds at 20 centimeters of water, and this could be followed by a second inflation at 25 centimeters of water. In the PPV arm, they received standard PPV. For the outcomes of intubation in the delivery room, BPD, and air leak, there appears to be some improvement in sustained lung inflation, but none of these were significant. Unfortunately, there was a significant increase in mortality in the sustained lung inflation arm, and this is why the trial was in fact stopped early at about 70% of planned enrollment. So clearly sustained lung inflation cannot be recommended at this time. Do be on the lookout for the results of the REVIVE trial, where babies that are depressed requiring chest compressions are randomized to receive sustained lung inflations in conjunction with chest compressions in order to decrease the time to return of spontaneous circulation. In the second part, we're going to talk about ways to give surfactant. And boy, wouldn't it be great if we could just grab the lungs by the trachea and squirt surfactant in them. And we want to do that because we know surfactant has so many benefits, including reducing RDS severity, reducing air leak, and reducing mortality. The first thing to realize is that every use of CPAP has to have a rescue way of giving surfactant. Traditionally, that's been intubating, giving surfactant, and leaving on mechanical ventilation. Another method is inshore, where you intubate, give surfactant, and extubate quickly. You give the surfactant through the ET tube, and this has the benefits of giving the surfactant while minimizing time on PPV. The third way I'll discuss is LISA. This is where a thin catheter is inserted into the trachea to give the surfactant. This has the benefits of surfactant with no possible way of giving PPV through that thin catheter. Well, what do we know about LISA to start with? Let's look at this network meta-analysis by Isiyama and colleagues from 2016. In this study, they compare six different strategies that weren't necessarily compared in any one trial. And the network meta-analysis aims to be able to compare these different strategies. So let's say you want to compare LISA to NIPPV. Well, no trial has been done comparing those two, as demonstrated by no black line connecting them. But presumably you can say something because LISA is compared to Insure and Insure is compared to CPAP and CPAP has been compared to NIPPV. Bottom line for this analysis was that LISA was the best strategy according to all these comparisons. Insure was probably second and CPAP was somewhere in the middle with mechanical ventilation being towards the bottom end. Now just a little summary about Insure. In that previous meta-analysis, there was 13 trials that included Insure in one of the arms of the studies. But that meta-analysis is not conclusive that Insure is better than either CPAP or mechanical ventilation. And so if you've intubated a baby to give surfactant, it's actually not very clear whether you should extubate back to CPAP or leave intubated on mechanical ventilation. But it's pretty hard to ignore that happy baby on CPAP, which is probably one reason why so many of us do try to use Insure. 
Another thing about the insure trials was that they use insure in multiple ways for prophylactic surfactant, for rescue surfactant, low threshold, high threshold. In contrast, trials using LISA have consistently used it as an early rescue form of surfactant for babies that are stable on CPAP but cross a low threshold for giving surfactant. But this then begs the question, which is the correct control to compare to? Is it mechanical ventilation with prophylactic surfactant? Well, like I said in the beginning, I think we're past that. I think it's CPAP. But even if it's CPAP, is it rescue by mechanical ventilation or by insure? And if it is rescue by insure, do we do it early versus late, a low versus high threshold? Well, I'm going to show you the way Lisa has been compared to several of these controls. But first, I wanted to show you a short clip of what Lisa actually looks like. So the baby is spontaneously breathing on CPAP. Then a thin catheter is placed, just like an intratracheal tube. The surfactant is put in slowly. And then the catheter is removed. Okay, from here, I'm going to look at several trials and meta-analyses that have compared LISA to other strategies. I'm going to start with the AMV trial, which stood for avoiding mechanical ventilation. And that compared LISA as our early rescue surfactant to CPAP, where the rescue form was mechanical ventilation and intubation. The trial enrolled all babies from 26 to 28 weeks gestation that were less than 12 hours of age, and it didn't matter whether you were on CPAP or intubated. If you were on CPAP and randomized to the LISA arm and you reached the threshold of 30% oxygen requirement, then you received surfactant by the LISA method. If you were on CPAP and randomized to the control arm, then CPAP failure was defined by each center, and when you reached that threshold, you were intubated, given surfactant, and then left on mechanical ventilation. In the results of the trial, they did actually show a reduction in the need for mechanical ventilation in the LISA arm, which was their primary outcome. But in the bigger outcomes of BPD, air leak, and mortality, there was no difference. If we go back to the network meta-analysis and look at just LISA versus CPAP in that study, they actually suggest that there's a decrease in death or BPD for LISA compared to CPAP, and they suggest there's moderate quality of evidence. But the most amazing thing about this is this right here, zero trials. When we go back and look at their graphic, sure enough, there's no line connecting CPAP and LISA, meaning that in their analysis, there was no trial comparing those two, which of course makes me ask, where's the AMV trial? Turns out their analysis excluded papers where the babies had been intubated before enrollment, which excluded the AMV trial. So the AMV trial might be the best we have for this comparison at this time, but be on the lookout for the Optimist A trial, a larger trial comparing CPAP to LISA in a very similar way as the AMV trial. The next paper I want to talk about in some depth is the NINSAP trial, which stood for Non-Intubated Surfactant Application. And this is a comparison of LISA to mechanical ventilation. And it's really a follow-up to the AMV trial done by the same authors, but they went for a smaller gestational age, from 23 to 26 weeks gestation. Babies were enrolled in this trial in the first two hours of life that were spontaneously breathing. That means if you were intubated, you could not be enrolled in this trial. And you had to cross the threshold of 30% oxygen requirement. So presumably, if you were on CPAP trucking along at 25% oxygen, you weren't enrolled in this trial and probably just stayed on CPAP. At enrollment, 100% of the babies received surfactant. In the LISA arm, they got it by LISA. In the mechanical ventilation arm, they got it by ET tube and then were left with mechanical ventilation. In the LISA arm, if you subsequently required more than 45% oxygen, that was considered CPAP failure and you were intubated and mechanically ventilated as well. Well, on to the results. While LISA looked better than mechanical ventilation in the three main outcomes I've been looking at, it was only significant for air leak. Other meta-analysis have been done comparing LISA to standard care and include the two trials that we just went over. My main point here is to show you that in this meta-analysis, how many different outcomes line up towards the left side, which in this case favors LISA, although they use the term LIST. Now, when you look at the meta-analysis lined up by trials, you actually see that they have it in three different sections. This section right here is the AMV trial, LISA versus CPAP. This section right here is the NINSAP trial, LISA versus mechanical ventilation. But the section I'm most interested in is this top one, LISA versus Insure. So if we're up to me, I would want to tear away those bottom two sections and just look at the top. But when you do that, you take away roughly half the patients in the meta-analysis because those were the two largest trials. And now when you look, LISA, in this outcome of BPD, doesn't appear to have improvement compared to Insure. Now just about the time we were looking at this for our own group, a little birdie told us about a new trial that had just come out that was comparing LISA to Insure and they called themselves the SURE group because that was their name for LISA. But I can assure you that SURE was the same thing as LISA.
This trial enrolled babies that were less than or equal to 34 weeks, although their actual median gestational age and inquartile range was quite older. They were enrolled at less than six hours of age if they were spontaneously breathing and an oxygen requirement greater than 30%. Again, if they were intubated or less than 30% oxygen, they would not be enrolled in this trial. After enrollment, 100% of babies got surfactant, just by the two different strategies, depending on which arm they were randomized into. Then they were put back on CPAP, which had a very high threshold for CPAP failure before they would be intubated and put on mechanical ventilation. The results are quite remarkable. In BPD, they had a decrease that was significant, 3.4% versus 17.1%. They didn't report air leaks, so I put in here mechanical ventilation in the first 72 hours, which was their primary outcome, also significantly reduced. And mortality wasn't significant, but it at least went in the right direction. So now if we update this meta-analysis to include this new paper, for just the papers comparing LISA to Insure and the outcome of BPD at 36 weeks, LISA is favored over Insure and it does not cross one showing significance. We also looked at the outcome of mechanical ventilation in the first 72 hours of life, and this also shows significance for LISA compared to Insure. Interestingly, there was another paper we found that reported outcomes of mechanical ventilation, but not BPD, so it's included in this updated meta-analysis. Now I'm going to try to sum this all up with an analogy. I'm living here in Houston, and there's a lot of great sports teams in Houston. But our football team just isn't one of them, at least not as judged by number of Super Bowl wins. And this is team mechanical ventilation. So we have to look for a better team to root for. Five-time Super Bowl champ Team CPAP is just down the road, and we can raise some short train tracks to that. But even there, if we look out in that misty distance, could there be something even better? Maybe we need to lay tracks to Pittsburgh for six-time Super Bowl champ Team Insure. But as I said, in 2019, I'm not convinced this is actually a better team than Team CPAP. Maybe we really need to be heading to Boston for six-time Super Bowl champion Team Lisa. After all, if you were a betting person trying to decide which team's most likely to get their next Super Bowl, you might be putting your money on Team Lisa. Well, how might these competing strategies play out in real life? There's a recent publication from the German Neonatal Research Network that was recently published that shed some light on this. Not surprisingly, the babies who were stable on CPAP and did not require surfactant, that means they were stable on CPAP and never crossed the 30% oxygen threshold, those are the babies that did the best with the lowest rates of BPD, as shown in blue. And the babies that were intubated, given surfactant, and left on mechanical ventilation, shown in black, did the worst. What was helpful to see is that the babies who crossed the 30% threshold but received LISA treatment, as shown in red, had similar BPD rates as the babies who were on CPAP, at least in the older gestational ages. In that same paper, there was this really nice quote, and I won't take the time to read it here, but you can pause and read it for yourself. But this one line really stood out to me, and it made me wonder, what would a comprehensive, non-invasive approach really look like? Maybe that strategy would look something like this. And the first thing to note in my version of this decision is outside of the simple decision whether the baby's breathing or not, there's no train tracks here. There's no straightforward decision. Everything's a bit windy. But if you've got a baby spontaneously breathing on CPAP and they don't cross 30% oxygen requirement, you should probably just leave them on CPAP. But if they do cross 30% oxygen, LISA appears to be a really good option. But what if before you can give them LISA, they actually cross over even higher oxygen requirement like 45%? Should you use Insure instead at that time? There are no studies that I am aware of comparing a lower threshold oxygen to a higher threshold oxygen for these two surfactant strategies, so we're left to wonder about that one on our own. If your baby at some point reaches your guidelines for CPAP failure, you're going to have to have a good rescue mode of mechanical ventilation. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Please like and share if you found it informative. And when you get a chance, please reach out to me and let me know your thoughts. I appreciate it. Thank you again.